Chapter Eight, Part One of the Confessions of Arsène Lupin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Confessions of Arsène Lupin by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter Eight, Lupin's Marriage. Monsieur Arsène Lupin has the honor to inform you of his approaching marriage with Mademoiselle Angélique de Sarzeau Vendôme, Princess de Bourbon Condé, and to request the pleasure of your company at the wedding, which will take place at the Church of Saint Clotilde. The Duc de Sarzeau Vendôme has the honor to inform you of the approaching marriage of his daughter Angélique, Princess de Bourbon Condé, with Monsieur Arsène Lupin, and to request. Jean, Duc de Sarzeau Vendôme, could not finish reading the invitations which he held in his trembling hand. Pale with anger, his long, lean body shaking with tremors. <sighs> there, he gasped, handing the two communications to his daughter. This is what our friends have received. This has been the talk of Paris since yesterday. What do you say to that dastardly insult, Angélique? What would your poor mother say to it if she were alive? Angélique was tall and thin like her father, skinny and angular like him. She was thirty-three years of age, always dressed in black stuff, shy and retiring in manner, with a head too small in proportion to her height, and narrowed on either side until the nose seemed to jut forth in protest against such parsimony. And yet it would be impossible to say that she was ugly, for her eyes were extremely beautiful, soft and grave, proud and a little sad, pathetic eyes which to see once was to remember. She flushed with shame at hearing her father's words, which told her the scandal of which she was the victim. But as she loved him, notwithstanding his harshness to her, his injustice and despotism, she said, "'Oh, I think it must be meant for a joke, father, to which we need pay no attention.' "'A joke? Why, everyone is gossiping about it. A dozen papers have printed the confounded notice this morning, with satirical comments. They quote our pedigree, our ancestors, our illustrious dead.' They pretend to take the thing seriously. Still, no one could believe. Of course not, but that doesn't prevent us from being the byword of Paris. It will all be forgotten by tomorrow. Tomorrow, my girl, people will remember that the name of Angélique de Sarzeau Vendôme has been bandied about as it should not be. Oh, if I could find out the name of a scoundrel who has dared! At that moment, Hyacinthe, the duke's valet, came in and said that Monsieur le duc was wanted on the telephone. Still fuming, he took down the receiver and growled, "'Well, who is it?' "'Yes, it's the Duc de Sarzeau Vendôme speaking.' A voice replied, "'I want to apologize to you, Monsieur le duc, and to Mademoiselle Angélique. It's my secretary's fault.' "'Your secretary?' "'Yes, the invitations were only a rough draft which I meant to submit to you. Unfortunately, my secretary thought.' "'But tell me, monsieur, who are you?' "'What, monsieur le duc, don't you know my voice? "'The voice of your future son-in-law?' "'What?' "'Arsène Lupin!' "'The duke dropped into a chair. "'His face was livid. "'Arsène Lupin! "'It's he! "'Arsène Lupin!' "'Angélique gave a smile. "'You see, father, it's only a joke, a hoax.' But the duke's rage broke out afresh, and he began to walk up and down, moving his arms. "'I shall go to the police. The fellow can't be allowed to make a fool of me in this way. If there's any law left in the land, it must be stopped.' Hyacinthe entered the room again. He brought two visiting cards. "'Chotoy, le petit?' "'Don't know them.' "'They are both journalists, Monsieur le Duc.' "'What do they want?' "'They would like to speak to Monsieur le Duc with regard to—' the marriage. Turn them out, exclaimed the duke, kick them out, and tell the porter not to admit scum of that sort to my house in future. Please, father, Angélique ventured to say, as for you, shut up. If you had consented to marry one of your cousins when I wanted you to, this wouldn't have happened. The same evening, one of the two reporters printed, on the front page of his paper, a somewhat fanciful story of his expedition to the family mansion of the Sarzeau Vendômes in the Rue de Varennes, and expatiated pleasantly upon the old nobleman's wrathful protests. The next morning, another newspaper published an interview with Arsène Lupin, which was supposed to have taken place in a lobby at the opera. Arsène Lupin retorted in a letter to the editor, "'I share my prospective father-in-law's indignation to the full. The sending out of the invitations was a gross breach of etiquette for which I am not responsible.' but for which I wish to make a public apology. 
"'Why, sir, the date of the marriage is not yet fixed. My bride's father suggests early in May. She and I think that six weeks is really too long to wait.' That which gave a special piquancy to the affair, and added immensely to the enjoyment of the friends of the family, was the Duke's well-known character, his pride in the uncompromising nature of his ideas and principles. Duke Jean was the last descendant of the Baron de Sarzeau, the most ancient family in Brittany. He was the lineal descendant of that Sarzeau who, upon marrying a Vendôme, refused to bear the new title which Louis XV forced upon him until after he had been imprisoned for ten years in the Bastille and he had abandoned none of the prejudices of the old régime. In his youth he followed the Comte de Chambord into exile. In his old age he refused a seat in the chamber on the pretext that a Sarzeau could only sit with his peers. The incident stung him to the quick. Nothing could pacify him. He cursed Lupin in good round terms, threatened him with every sort of punishment, and rounded on his daughter. "'There, if you had only married! After all, you had plenty of chances.' Your three cousins, Mussy, D'Amboise, and Caoche, are noblemen of good descent, allied to the best families, fairly well off, and they are still anxious to marry you. Why do you refuse them? Ah, oh, because Miss is a dreamer, a sentimentalist, and because her cousins are too fat, or too thin, or too coarse for her. She was, in fact, a dreamer. Left to her own devices from childhood, she had read all the books of chivalry, all the colourless romances of olden time that littered the ancestral presses and she looked upon life as a fairy-tale in which the beauteous maidens are always happy, while the others wait till death for the bridegroom which does not come. Why should she marry one of her cousins when they were only after her money, the millions which she had inherited from her mother? She might as well remain an old maid and go on dreaming. She answered gently, "'You will end by making yourself ill, father. Forget this silly business.' But how could he forget? Every morning some pinprick renewed his wound. Three days running, Angelique received a wonderful sheaf of flowers, with Arsène Lupin's card peeping from it. The Duke could not go to his club, but a friend accosted him. That was a good one today. What was? Why, your son-in-law's latest. Haven't you seen it? Here, read it for yourself. Monsieur Arsène Lupin is petitioning the Council of State for permission to add his wife's name to his own, and to be known henceforth as Lupin de Sarzeau-Vendôme. And the next day he read, as the young bride, by virtue of an unrepealed decree of Charles X, bears the title and arms of the Bourbon Condés, of whom she is the heiress of line, the eldest son of the Dupin de Sarzeau Vendôme will be styled Prince de Bourbon Condé. And the day after, an advertisement. Exhibition of Mademoiselle de Sarzeau Vendôme's trousseau at Messieurs Blank, Great Linen Warehouse, each article marked with initials L.S.V. Then an illustrated paper published a photographic scene the duke, his daughter, and his son-in-law sitting at a table playing three-handed auction bridge. And the date also was announced with a great flourish of trumpets, the 4th of May. And particulars were given of the marriage settlement. Lupin showed himself wonderfully disinterested. He was prepared to sign, the newspapers said, with his eyes closed, without knowing the figure of the dowry. All these things drove the old duke crazy. His hatred of Lupin assumed morbid proportions. Much as it went against the grain, he called on the prefect of police, who advised him to be on his guard. We know the gentleman's ways. He is employing one of his favourite dodges. Forgive the expression, Monsieur le Duc, but he is nursing you. Don't fall into the trap. What dodge? What trap? asked the Duke anxiously. He is trying to make you lose your head, and to lead you by intimidation to do something which you would refuse to do in cold blood. Still, M. Arsène Lupin can hardly hope that I will offer him my daughter's hand. No, but he hopes that you will commit, to put it mildly, a blunder. What blunder? Exactly that blunder which he wants you to commit. Then you think, Monsieur le Préfet? I think the best thing you can do, Monsieur le Duc, is to go home, or if all this excitement worries you, to run down to the country and stay there quietly, without upsetting yourself. This conversation only increased the old duke's fears. Lupin appeared to him in the light of a terrible person, who employed diabolical methods and kept accomplices in every sphere of society. Prudence was the watchword. And life from that moment became intolerable. The duke grew more crabbed and silent than ever, and denied his door to all his old friends, and even to Angélique's three suitors, her cousins de Mussy, d'Amboise, and de Caorche 
who were none of them on speaking terms with the others in consequence of their rivalry and who were in the habit of calling turn and turn about every week for no earthly reason he dismissed his butler and his coachman but he dared not fill their places for fear of engaging creatures of arsene lupin's and his own man hyacinthe in whom he had every confidence having had him in his service for over forty years had to take upon himself the laborious duties of the stables and the pantry come father said angelique trying to make him listen to common sense i really can't see what you are afraid of no one can force me into this ridiculous marriage well of course that's not what i'm afraid of what then father how can i tell an abduction a burglary an act of violence there is no doubt that the villain is scheming something and there is also no doubt that we are surrounded by spies one afternoon he received a newspaper in which the following paragraph was marked in red pencil the signing of the marriage contract is fixed for this evening at the sarzeau vendome townhouse it will be quite a private ceremony and only a few privileged friends will be present to congratulate the happy pair the witnesses to the contract on behalf of mademoiselle de sarzeau vendome the prince de la rochefoucauld limour and the comte de chartres will be introduced by m arsene lupin to the two gentlemen who have claimed the honour of acting as his groomsmen namely the prefect of police and the governor of the sante prison ten minutes later the duke sent his servant hyacinthe to the post with three express messages at four o'clock in angelique's presence he saw the three cousins mussy fat heavy pasty-faced d'amboise slender fresh-coloured and shy Carche, short thin and unhealthy-looking all three old bachelors by this time lacking distinction in dress or appearance the meeting was a short one the duke had worked out his whole plan of campaign a defensive campaign of which he set forth the first stage in explicit terms angelique and i will leave paris to-night for our place in brittany i rely on you my three nephews to help us get away you d'amboise will come and fetch us in your car with the hood up you you see will bring your big motor and kindly see to the luggage with hyacinthe my man you carche will go to the gare d'orleans and book our berths in the sleeping car for vannes by the ten forty train is that settled the rest of the day passed without incident the duke to avoid any accidental indiscretion waited until after dinner to tell hyacinthe to pack a trunk and a portmanteau hyacinthe was to accompany them as well as angelique's maid at nine o'clock all the other servants went to bed by their master's order at ten minutes to ten the duke who was completing his preparations heard the sound of a motor horn the porter opened the gates of the courtyard the duke standing at the window recognized d'amboise's landolette tell him i shall be down presently he said to hyacinthe and let mademoiselle know in a few minutes as hyacinthe did not return he left his room but he was attacked on the landing by two masked men who gagged and bound him before he could utter a cry and one of the men said to him in a low voice take this as a first morning monsieur le duc if you persist in leaving paris and refusing your consent it will be a more serious matter and the same man said to his companion keep an eye on him i will see to the young lady by that time two other confederates had secured the lady's maid and angelique herself gagged lay fainting on a couch in her boudoir she came to almost immediately under the stimulus of a bottle of salts held to her nostrils and when she opened her eyes she saw bending over her a young man in evening clothes with a smiling and friendly face who said i implore your forgiveness mademoiselle all these happenings are a trifle sudden and this behaviour rather out of the way but circumstances often compel us to deeds of which our conscience does not approve pray pardon me he took her hand very gently and slipped a broad gold ring on the girl's finger saying there now we are engaged never forget the man who gave you this ring he entreats you not to run away from him and to stay in paris and await the proofs of his devotion have faith in him he said all this in so serious and respectful a voice with so much authority and deference that she had not the strength to resist their eyes met he whispered the exquisite purity of your eyes it would be heavenly to live with those eyes upon one now close them he withdrew his accomplices followed suit the car drove off and the house in the rue de varennes remained still and silent until the moment when angelique regaining complete consciousness called out for the servants they found the duke 
Hyacinthe, the lady's maid, and the porter and his wife, all tightly bound. A few priceless ornaments had disappeared, as well as the duke's pocket-book and all his jewellery, tie-pins, pearl studs, watch, and so on. The police were advised without delay. In the morning it appeared that, on the evening before, d'Amboise, when leaving his house in the motor-car, was stabbed by his own chauffeur and thrown, half-dead, into a deserted street. Mussy and Caorche had each received a telephone message, purporting to come from the duke, countermanding their attendance. Next week, without troubling further about the police investigation, without obeying the summons of the examining magistrate, without even reading Arsène Lupin's letters to the papers on the Varenne flight, the duke, his daughter, and his valet stealthily took a slow train for Vannes, and arrived one evening at the old feudal castle that towers over the headland of Sarzeau. The duke at once organized a defense with the aid of the Breton peasants, true medieval vassals to a man. On the fourth day, Mussy arrived, on the fifth, Caorche, and on the seventh, D'Amboise, whose wound was not as severe as had been feared. The duke waited two days longer before communicating to those about him what, now that his escape had succeeded in spite of Lupin, he called the second part of his plan. He did so, in the presence of the three cousins, by a dictatorial order to Angélique, expressed in these peremptory terms. "'All this bother is upsetting me terribly. I have entered on a struggle with this man whose daring you have seen for yourself, and the struggle is killing me. I want to end it at all costs. There is only one way of doing so, Angélique, and that is for you to release me from all responsibility by accepting the hand of one of your cousins. Before a month is out, you must be the wife of Mussy, Carche, or D'Amboise. You have a free choice. Make your decision.' For four whole days Angélique wept and entreated her father, but in vain. She felt that he would be inflexible and that she must end by submitting to his wishes. She accepted. "'Whichever you please, father. I love none of them, so I may as well be unhappy with one as with the other.' Thereupon a fresh discussion ensued, as the duke wanted to compel her to make her own choice. She stood firm. Reluctantly, and for financial considerations, he named D'Amboise. The bans were published without delay. From that moment the watch in and around the castle was increased twofold, all the more inasmuch as Lupin's silence and the sudden cessation of the campaign which he had been conducting in the press could not but alarm the Duc de Sarzeau Vendôme. It was obvious that the enemy was getting ready to strike, and would endeavour to oppose the marriage by one of his characteristic moves. Nevertheless, nothing happened. Nothing two days before the ceremony, nothing on the day before nothing on the morning itself. The marriage took place in the mayor's office, followed by the religious celebration in church, and the thing was done. Then, and not till then, the duke breathed freely. Notwithstanding his daughter's sadness, notwithstanding the embarrassed silence of his son-in-law, who found the situation a little trying, he rubbed his hands with an air of pleasure, as though he had achieved a brilliant victory. "'Tell them to lower the drawbridge,' he said to Hyacinthe, and to admit everybody." We have nothing more to fear from that scoundrel. After the wedding breakfast, he had wine served out to the peasants and clinked glasses with them. They danced and sang. At three o'clock, he returned to the ground-floor rooms. It was the hour for his afternoon nap. He walked to the guard-room at the end of the suite, but he had no sooner placed his foot on the threshold than he stopped suddenly and exclaimed, "'What are you doing here, D'Amboise? Is this a joke?' D'Amboise was standing before him, dressed as a Breton fisherman, in a dirty jacket and breeches, torn, patched, and many sizes too large for him. The duke seemed dumbfounded. He stared with eyes of amazement at that face which he knew and which, at the same time, roused memories of a very distant past within his brain. Then he strode abruptly to one of the windows overlooking the castle terrace and called, "'Angélique!' "'What is it, father?' she asked, coming forward. "'Where's your husband?' "'Over there, father,' said Angélique, pointing to D'Amboise, who was smoking a cigarette and reading some way off. The duke stumbled and fell into a chair, with a great shudder of fright. "'Oh! I shall go mad!' But the man in the fisherman's garb knelt down before him and said, "'Look at me, uncle. You know me, don't you? I'm your nephew, the one who used to play here in the old days, the one whom you called Jaco. Just think a minute. Here, look at this scar.' "'Yes, yes,' stammered the duke. "'I recognize you. It's Jacques. But the other one—' He put his hands to his head. 
And yet... No, it can't be. Explain yourself. I don't understand. I don't want to understand. There was a pause, during which the newcomer shut the window and closed the door leading to the next room. Then he came up to the old duke, touched him gently on the shoulder, to wake him from his torpor, and without further preface, as though to cut short any explanation that was not absolutely necessary, spoke as follows. Four years ago, that is to say, in the eleventh year of my voluntary exile, when I settled in the extreme south of Algeria, I made the acquaintance, in the course of a hunting expedition, arranged by a big Arab chief, of a man whose geniality, whose charm of manner, whose consummate prowess, whose indomitable pluck, whose combined humour and depth of mind fascinated me in the highest degree. The Comte d'Andrézy spent six weeks as my guest. After he left, we kept up a correspondence at regular intervals. I also often saw his name in the papers, in the society and sporting columns. He was to come back, and I was preparing to receive him three months ago, when one evening as I was out riding, my two Arab attendants flung themselves upon me, bound me, blindfolded me, and took me, travelling day and night for a week, along deserted roads, to a bay on the coast, where five men awaited them. I was at once carried on board a small steam-yacht, which weighed anchor without delay. There was nothing to tell me who the men were, nor what their object was in kidnapping me. They had locked me into a narrow cabin, secured by a massive door, and lighted by a porthole protected by two iron crossbars. Every morning a hand was inserted through a hatch between the next cabin and my own, and placed on my bunk two or three pounds of bread, a good helping of food, and a flagon of wine, and removed the remains of yesterday's meals, which I put there for the purpose. From time to time, at night, the yacht stopped, and I heard the sound of the boat rowing to some harbour, and then returning, doubtless with provisions. Then we set out once more, without hurrying, as though on a cruise of people of our class, who travel for pleasure and are not pressed for time. Sometimes, standing on a chair, I would see the coastline through my porthole, too indistinctly, however, to locate it. And this lasted for weeks. One morning, in the ninth week, I perceived that the hatch had been left unfastened, and I pushed it open. The cabin was empty at the time. With an effort, I was able to take a nail-file from a dressing-table. Two weeks after that, by dint of patient perseverance, I had succeeded in filing through the bars of my porthole, and I could have escaped that way, only though I am a good swimmer, I soon grow tired. I had therefore to choose a moment when the yacht was not too far from the land. It was not until yesterday that, perched on my chair, I caught sight of the coast, and in the evening, at sunset, I recognized to my astonishment the outlines of the Chateau de Sarzeau, with its pointed turrets and its square keep. I wondered if this was the goal of my mysterious voyage. All night long we cruised in the offing, the same all day yesterday. At last this morning we put in at a distance which I considered favourable, all the more so as we were steaming through rocks under cover of which I could swim unobserved. But just as I was about to make my escape, I noticed that the shutter of the hatch, which they thought they had closed, had once more opened of itself and was flapping against the partition. I again pushed it ajar from curiosity. Within arm's length was a little cupboard which I managed to open, and in which my hand, groping at random, laid hold of a bundle of papers. This consisted of letters, letters containing instructions addressed to the pirates who held me prisoner. An hour later, when I wriggled through the porthole and slipped into the sea, I knew all. The reasons for my abduction, the means employed, the object in view, and the infamous scheme plotted during the last three months against the Duc de Sarzeau Vendôme and his daughter. Unfortunately, it was too late. I was obliged, in order not to be seen from the yacht, to crouch in the cleft of a rock, and did not reach land until midday. By the time that I had been to a fisherman's cabin, exchanged my clothes for his, and come on here, it was three o'clock. On my arrival I learned that Angélique's marriage was celebrated this morning. End of chapter 8, part 1《
At times the thought of the warnings given him by the prefect of police returned to his mind. "'They're nursing you, Monsieur le Duc. They are nursing you.' He said in a hollow voice, "'Speak on. Finish your story. All this is ghastly. I don't understand it yet. And I feel nervous.' The stranger resumed. "'I am sorry to say the story is easily pieced together and is summed up in a few sentences. It is like this.' The Comte d'Andrézy remembered several things from his stay with me, and from the confidences which I was foolish enough to make to him. First of all, I was your nephew, and yet you had seen comparatively little of me, because I left Salzot when I was quite a child, and since then our intercourse was limited to the few weeks which I spent here, fifteen years ago, when I proposed for the hand of my cousin Angélique. Secondly, having broken with the past, I received no letters. Lastly, there was a certain physical resemblance between d'Andrézy and myself which could be accentuated to such an extent as to become striking. His scheme was built up on those three points. He bribed my Arab servants to give him warning in case I left Algeria. Then he went back to Paris, bearing my name and made up to look exactly like me, came to see you, was invited to your house once a fortnight, and lived under my name, which thus became one of the many aliases beneath which he conceals his real identity. Three months ago, when the apple was ripe, as he says in his letters, he began the attack by a series of communications to the press, and at the same time, fearing no doubt that some newspaper would tell me in Algeria the part that was being played under my name in Paris, he had me assaulted by my servants and kidnapped by his confederates. I need not explain any more in so far as you are concerned, uncle. The Duc de Salzo Vendôme was shaking with a fit of nervous trembling. The awful truth to which he refused to open his eyes appeared to him in its nakedness, and assumed the hateful countenance of the enemy. He clutched his nephew's hands and said to him fiercely, despairingly, "'It's Lupin, is it not?' "'Yes, uncle.' "'And it's to him. It's to him that I have given my daughter.' "'Yes, uncle, to him, who has stolen my name of Jacques d'Amboise from me, and stolen your daughter from you.' Angelique is the wedded wife of Arsène Lupin, and that in accordance with your orders. This letter in his handwriting bears witness to it. He has upset your whole life, thrown you off your balance, besieging your hours of waking and your nights of dreaming, rifling your townhouse until the moment when, seized with terror, you took refuge here, where, thinking that you would escape his artifices and his rapacity, you told your daughter to choose one of her three cousins, Mussy, D'Amboise, or Carche, as her husband." "'But why did she select that one rather than the others?' "'It was you who selected him, uncle.' "'At random, because he had the biggest income.' "'No, not at random, but on the insidious, persistent, and very clever advice of your servant, Hyacinthe.' The duke gave a start. "'What? Is Hyacinthe an accomplice?' "'No, not of Arsène Lupin but of the man whom he believed to be d'Amboise, and who promised to give him a hundred thousand francs within a week after the marriage. Oh, the villain! He planned everything, foresaw everything. Foresaw everything, uncle, down to shamming an attempt upon his life so as to avert suspicion, down to shamming a wound received in your service. But with what object? Why all these dastardly tricks? Angélique has a fortune of eleven million francs. Your solicitor in Paris was to hand the securities next week to the counterfeit d'Amboise, who had only to realize them forthwith and disappear. But this very morning you yourself were to hand your son-in-law, as a personal wedding present, five hundred thousand francs worth of bearer stock, which he has arranged to deliver to one of his accomplices at nine o'clock this evening, outside the castle, near the great oak, so that they may be negotiated to-morrow morning in Brussels. The Duc de Salzot Vendôme had risen from his seat and was stamping furiously up and down the room. "'At nine o'clock this evening,' he said. "'We'll see about that. We'll see about that. I'll have the gendarme here before then.' Arsène Lupin laughed at gendarme. "'Let's telegraph to Paris.' "'Yes, but how about the five hundred thousand francs? And still worse, uncle, the scandal!' Think of this, your daughter, Angélique de Salzot Vendôme, married to that swindler, that thief. No, no, it would never do. What then? What? The nephew now rose and, stepping to a gun-rack, took down a rifle and laid it on the table in front of the duke. 
away in algeria uncle on the verge of the desert when we find ourselves face to face with a wild beast we do not send for the gendarme we take our rifle and we shoot the wild beast otherwise the beast would tear us to pieces with its claws what do you mean i mean that over there i acquired the habit of dispensing with the gendarme it is a rather summary way of doing justice but it is the best way believe me and to-day in the present case it is the only way once the beast is killed you and i will bury it in some corner unseen and unknown and angelique we will tell her later what will become of her she will be my wife the wife of the real d'amboise i desert her to-morrow and return to algeria the divorce will be granted in two months time the duke listened pale and staring with set jaws he whispered are you sure that his accomplices on the yacht will not inform him of your escape not before to-morrow so that so that inevitably at nine o'clock this evening arsene lupin on his way to the great oak will take the patrol path that follows the old ramparts and skirts the ruins of the chapel i shall be there in the ruins i shall be there too said the duc de sarzeau vendome quietly taking down a gun it was now five o'clock the duke talked some time longer to his nephew examined the weapons loaded them with fresh cartridges then when night came he took d'amboise through the dark passages to his bedroom and hid him in an adjoining closet nothing further happened until dinner the duke forced himself to keep calm during the meal from time to time he stole a glance at his son-in-law and was surprised at the likeness between him and the real d'amboise it was the same complexion the same cast of features the same cut of hair nevertheless the look of the eye was different keener in this case and brighter and gradually the duke discovered minor details which had passed unperceived till then and which proved the fellow's imposture the party broke up after dinner it was eight o'clock the duke went to his room and released his nephew ten minutes later under cover of the darkness they slipped into the ruins gun in hand meanwhile angelique accompanied by her husband had gone to the suite of rooms which she occupied on the ground floor of a tower that flanked the left wing her husband stopped at the entrance to the rooms and said i'm going for a short stroll angelique may i come to you here when i return yes she replied he left her and went up to the first floor which had been assigned to him as his quarters the moment he was alone he locked the door noiselessly opened a window that looked over the landscape and leaned out he saw a shadow at the foot of the tower, some hundred feet or more below him. He whistled and received a faint whistle in reply. He then took from a cupboard a thick leather satchel, crammed with papers, wrapped it in a piece of black cloth and tied it up. Then he sat down at the table and wrote, "'Glad you got my message, for I think it unsafe to walk out of the castle with that large bundle of securities. Here they are. You will be in Paris on your motorcycle in time to catch the morning train to Brussels, where you will hand over the bonds to Z, and he will negotiate them at once. P.S. As you pass by the great oak, tell our chaps that I'm coming. I have some instructions to give them. But everything is going well. No one here has the least suspicion. He fastened the letter to the parcel, and lowered both through the window with a length of string. Good, he said. That's all right. It's a weight off my mind. He waited a few minutes longer, stalking up and down the room and smiling at the portraits of two gallant gentlemen hanging on the wall. Horace de Sarzeau Vendôme, Marshal of France, and you, the great Condé, I salute you, my ancestors both. Lupin de Sarzeau Vendôme will show himself worthy of you. At last, when the time came, he took his hat and went down. But when he reached the ground floor, Angelique burst from her rooms and exclaimed, with a distraught air, I say, if you don't mind, think you had better. And then, without saying more, she went in again, leaving a vision of irresponsible terror in her husband's mind. She's out of sorts, he said to himself. Marriage doesn't suit her. He lit a cigarette and went out, without attaching importance to an incident that ought to have impressed him. Poor Angelique, this will all end in a divorce. The night outside was dark, with a cloudy sky. The servants were closing the shutters of the castle. There was no light in the windows, it being the duke's habit to go to bed soon after dinner. Lupin passed the gatekeeper's lodge, and, as he put his foot on the drawbridge, said, 
Leave the gate open. I am going for a breath of air. I shall be back soon. The patrol path was on the right, and ran along one of the old ramparts, which used to surround the castle with a second and much larger enclosure, until it ended at an almost demolished postern gate. The, the park, which skirted a hillock and afterward followed the side of a deep valley, was bordered on the left by thick coppices. "'What a wonderful place for an ambush,' he said. "'A regular cutthroat spot.' He stopped, thinking that he heard a noise. But no, it was a rustling of the leaves. And yet a stone went rattling down the slopes, bounding against the rugged projections of the rock. But strange to say, nothing seemed to disquiet him. The crisp sea-breeze came blowing over the plains of the headland, and he eagerly filled his lungs with it. "'What a thing it is to be alive,' he thought. "'Still young, a member of the old nobility, a multimillionaire. What could a man want more?' At a short distance he saw against the darkness the yet darker outline of the chapel, the ruins of which towered above the path. A few drops of rain began to fall, and he heard a clock strike nine. He quickened his pace. There was a short descent, then the path rose again, and suddenly he stopped once more. A hand had seized his. He drew back, tried to release himself. But someone stepped from the clump of trees against which he was brushing, and a voice said, Shh, not a word. He recognized his wife, Angélique. "'What's the matter?' he asked. She whispered so low that he could hardly catch the words. "'They are lying in wait for you. They are in there, in the ruins, with their guns.' "'Who?' "'Keep quiet. Listen.' They stood for a moment without stirring, then she said, "'They are not moving. Perhaps they never heard me. Let's go back. But come with me.' Her accent was so imperious that he obeyed without further question. But suddenly she took fright. "'Run! They are coming! I'm sure of it!' True enough, they heard a sound of footsteps. Then, swiftly, still holding him by the hand, she dragged him with irresistible energy along a shortcut, following its turns without hesitation in spite of the darkness and the brambles, and they very soon arrived at the drawbridge. She put her arm in his. The gatekeeper touched his cap. They crossed the courtyard and entered the castle, and she led him to the corner tower in which both of them had their apartments. "'Come in here,' she said. "'To your rooms?' "'Yes.' Two maids were sitting up for her. Their mistress ordered them to retire to their rooms on the third floor. Almost immediately after, there was a knock at the door of the outer room, and a voice called, "'Angélique!' "'Is that you, father?' she asked, suppressing her agitation. "'Yes. Is your husband here?' We have just come in. Tell him I want to speak to him. Ask him to come to my room. It's important. Very well, father. I'll send him to you. She listened for a few seconds, then returned to the boudoir where her husband was, and said, I'm sure my father is still there. He moved as though to go out. In that case, if he wants to speak to me... My father is not alone, she said quickly, blocking his way. Who is with him? His nephew, Jacques d'Amboise. There was a moment's silence. He looked at her with a certain astonishment, failing quite to understand his wife's attitude, but without pausing to go into the matter. Ah, so that dear old d'Amboise is there, he chuckled. Then the fat's in the fire. Unless, indeed... My father knows everything, she said. I overheard a conversation between them just now. His nephew has read certain letters. I hesitated at first about telling you. Then I thought of my duty... He studied her afresh, but at once conquered by the queerness of the situation, he burst out laughing. <laughs> what? Don't my friends on board ship burn my letters? And they have let their prisoner escape? The idiots! Oh, and you don't see to everything yourself. No matter, it's distinctly humorous. D'Amboise versus D'Amboise. Oh, but suppose I were no longer recognized. Suppose D'Amboise himself were to confuse me with himself. He turned to a wash-hand stand, took a towel, dipped it in the basin, and soaked it, and, in the twinkling of an eye, wiped the make-up from his face and altered the set of his hair. "'That's it,' he said, showing himself to Angélique under the aspect in which she had seen him on the night of the burglary in Paris. "'I feel more comfortable like this for a discussion with my father-in-law.' "'Where are you going?' she cried, flinging herself in front of the door. "'Why, to join the gentleman?' "'You shall not pass!' Why not? 
Suppose they kill you. Kill me? That's what they mean to do, to kill you, to hide your body somewhere. Who would know of it? Very well, he said. From their point of view, they are quite right. But if I don't go to them, they will come here. That door won't stop them. Nor you, I'm thinking. Therefore, it's better to have done with it. Follow me, commanded Angélique. She took up the lamp that lit the room, went into her bedroom, pushed aside the wardrobe, which slid easily on hidden casters, pulled back an old tapestry hanging, and said, Here is a door that has not been used for years. My father believes the key to be lost. I have it here. Unlock the door with it. A staircase in the wall will take you to the bottom of the tower. You need only draw the bolts of another door, and you will be free. He could hardly believe his ears. Suddenly he grasped the meaning of Angélique's whole behaviour. In front of that sad, plain, but wonderfully gentle face, he stood for a moment discountenanced, almost abashed. He no longer thought of laughing. A feeling of respect, mingled with remorse and kindness, overcame him. Why, why are you saving me? he whispered. You are my husband. He protested. No, no, I have stolen that title. The law will never recognize my marriage. My father does not want a scandal, she said. Just so, he replied sharply. Just so. I foresaw that, and that was why I had your cousin D'Amboise near at hand. Once I disappear, he becomes your husband. He is the man you have married in the eyes of men. You are the man I have married in the eyes of the church. The church, the church. There are means of arranging matters with the church. Your marriage can be annulled. On what pretext that we can admit? He remained silent, thinking over all those points which he had not considered, all those points which were trivial and absurd for him, but which were serious for her, and he repeated several times, oh, This is terrible! This is terrible! I should have anticipated! And suddenly, seized with an idea, he clapped his hands and cried, There, I have it! I'm hand in glove with one of the chief figures at the Vatican. The Pope never refuses me anything. I shall obtain an audience, and I have no doubt that the Holy Father, moved by my entreaties. His plan was so humorous and his delight so artless that Angélique could not help smiling, and she said, I am your wife in the eyes of God. She gave him a look that showed neither scorn nor animosity, nor even anger, and he realized that she omitted to see in him the outlaw and the evildoer, and remembered only the man who was her husband, and to whom the priest had bound her until the hour of death. He took a step toward her, and observed her more attentively. She did not lower her eyes at first, but she blushed. And never had he seen so pathetic a face, marked with such modesty and such dignity. He said to her, as on that first evening in Paris, "'Oh, your eyes! The calm and sadness of your eyes! The beauty of your eyes!' She dropped her head and stammered, "'Go, go away, go!' In the presence of her confusion, he received a quick intuition of the deeper feelings that stirred her, unknown to herself. To that spinster soul, of which he recognized the romantic power of imagination, the unsatisfied yearnings, the poring over old-world books, he suddenly represented, in that exceptional moment and in consequence of the unconventional circumstances of their meetings, somebody special, a Byronic hero, a chivalrous brigand of romance. One evening, in spite of all obstacles, he, the world-famed adventurer, already ennobled in song and story, and exalted by his own audacity, had come to her and slipped the magic ring upon her finger, a mystic and passionate betrothal, as in the days of Corsair and Hernani. Greatly moved and touched, he was on the verge of giving way to an enthusiastic impulse and exclaiming, "'Let us go away together. Let us fly. You are my bride, my wife. Share my dangers, my sorrows, and my joys. It will be a strange and vigorous a proud and magnificent life. But Angélique's eyes were raised to his again, and they were so pure and so noble that he blushed in his turn. This was not the woman to whom such words could be addressed. He whispered, Forgive me. I am a contemptible wretch. I have wrecked your life. No, she replied softly. On the contrary, you have shown me where my real life lies. He was about to ask her to explain, but she had opened the door and was pointing the way to him. Nothing more could be spoken between them. He went out without a word, bowing very low as he passed. 
A month later, Angélique de Sarzeau-Vendôme, Princess de Bourbon-Condé, lawful wife of Arsène Lupin, took the veil and, under the name of Sister Marie-Auguste, buried herself within the walls of the Visitation Convent. On the day of the ceremony, the mother superior of the convent received a heavy sealed envelope containing a letter with the following words. For Sister Marie-Auguste Poor. Enclosed with the letter were five hundred banknotes of a thousand francs each. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of the Confessions of Arsène Lupin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Confessions of Arsène Lupin by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter 9 The Invisible Prisoner. One day, at about four o'clock, as evening was drawing in, Farmer Gousseau, with his four sons, returned from a day's shooting. They were stalwart men, all five of them, long of limb, broad chested, with faces tanned by sun and wind and all five displayed, planted on an enormous neck and shoulders, the same small head with the low forehead, thin lips, beaked nose, and hard and repellent cast of countenance. They were feared and disliked by all around them. They were a money-grubbing, crafty family, and their word was not to be trusted. On reaching the old barbican wall that surrounds the Eberville property, the farmer opened a narrow, massive door, putting the big key back in his pocket after his sons had passed in and he walked behind them along the path that led through the orchards. Here and there stood great trees, stripped by the autumn winds and clumps of pines, the last survivors of the ancient park now covered by old Gousseau's farm. One of the sons said, "'I hope mother has lit a log or two. "'There's smoke coming from the chimney,' said the father. The outhouses and the homestead showed at the end of the lawn, and above them the village church, whose steeple seemed to prick the clouds that trailed along the sky. "'All the guns unloaded?' asked old Gousseau. "'Mine isn't,' said the eldest. "'I slipped in a bullet to blow a kestrel's head off.' He was the one who was proudest of his skill, and he said to his brothers, "'Look at that bough at the top of the cherry-tree. See me snap it off.' On the bough sat a scarecrow, which had been there since spring, and which protected the leafless branches with its idiot arms. He raised his gun and fired. The figure came tumbling down with large, comic gestures, and was caught on a big lower branch where it remained lying stiff on its stomach, with a great top hat on its head of rags, and its hay-stuffed legs swaying from right to left, above some water that flowed past the cherry-tree through a wooden trough. They all laughed. The father approved. "'A fine shot, my lad. Besides, the old boy was beginning to annoy me. I couldn't take my eyes from my plate at meals without catching sight of that oaf.' They went a few steps farther. They were not more than thirty yards from the house when the father stopped suddenly and said, "'Hallo! What's up?' The sons also had stopped and stood listening. One of them said, under his breath, "'It comes from the house, from the linen-room.' And another spluttered, it "'Sounds like moans! And mother's alone!' Suddenly a frightful scream rang out. All five rushed forward. Another scream, followed by cries of despair. "'We're here! We're coming!' shouted the eldest, who was leading. And as it was a roundabout way to the door, he smashed in a window with his fist and sprang into the old people's bedroom. The room next to it was the linen room, in which Mother Gousseau spent most of her time. "'Damnation!' he said, seeing her lying on the floor with blood all over her face. "'Dad! Dad!' "'What? Where is she?' roared old Gousseau, appearing on the scene. "'Good Lord! What's this? What have they done to your mother?' She pulled herself together and, with outstretched arm, stammered, R -r "'Run after him! This way! This way! I'm all right, only a scratch or two. But run, you! He's taken the money!' The father and sons gave a bound. "'He's taken the money!' bellowed old Gousseau, rushing to the door to which his wife was pointing. "'He's taken the money! Stop, thief!' But a sound of several voices rose at the end of the passage through which the other three sons were coming. "'I saw him! I saw him!' "'So did I! He ran up the stairs! No, there he is! He's coming down again!' A mad steeplechase shook every floor in the house. Farmer Gousseau, on reaching the end of the passage, caught sight of a man standing by the front door trying to open it. If he succeeded, it meant safety, 
escaped through the market square and the back lanes of the village. Interrupted as he was fumbling at the bolts, the man turning stupid, lost his head, charged at old Gousseau and sent him spinning, dodged the eldest brother and, pursued by the four sons, doubled back down the long passage, ran into the old couple's bedroom, flung his legs through the broken window, and disappeared. The sons rushed after him across the lawns and orchards, now darkened by the falling night. "'The villain's done for,' chuckled old Gousseau. "'There's no way out for him. The walls are too high. He's done for, the scoundrel!' The two farmhands returned at that moment from the village, and he told them what had happened and gave each of them a gun. "'If the swine shows his nose anywhere near the house,' he said, "'let fly at him. Give him no mercy.' He told them where to stand, went to make sure that the farm gates, which were only used for the carts, were locked, and not till then remembered that his wife might perhaps be in need of aid. "'Well, mother, how goes it?' "'Where is he? Have you got him?' she asked in a breath. "'Yes, we're after him. The lads must have collared him by now.' The news quite restored her, and a nip of rum gave her the strength to drag herself to the bed, with old Gousseau's assistance, and to tell her story." For that matter, there was not much to tell. She had just lit the fire in the living hall, and she was knitting quietly at her bedroom window, waiting for the men to return, when she thought that she heard a slight grating sound in the linen room next door. I must have left the cat in there, she thought to herself. She went in, suspecting nothing, and was astonished to see the two doors of one of the linen cupboards, the one in which they hid their money, wide open. She walked up to it, still without suspicion there was a man there, hiding, with his back to the shelves. "'But how did he get in?' asked old Gousseau. "'Through the passage, I suppose. We never keep the back door shut.' "'And then did he go for you?' "'No, I went for him. He tried to get away.' "'You should have let him. And what about the money?' "'Had he taken it by then?' <laughs> "'Had he taken it? I saw the bundle of banknotes in his hands, the sweep. I would have let him kill me sooner.' Oh, we had a sharp tussle, I give you my word. Then he had no weapon? No more than I did. We had our fingers, our nails, and our teeth. Look here where he bit me, and I yelled and screamed. Only I'm an old woman, you see. I had to let go of him. Do you know the man? I'm pretty sure it was old Trenard. The tramp? Why, of course it's old Trenard, cried the farmer. I thought I knew him, too. Besides, he's been hanging round the house these last three days. The old vagabond must have smelt the money. Aha, Trenard, my man, we shall see some fun. A number one hiding in the first place, and then the police. I say, mother, you can get up now, can't you? Then go and fetch the neighbours, ask them to run for the gendarme. By the by, the attorney's youngster has a bicycle. How oh, that damned old Trenard scooted. He's got good legs for his age, he has. He can run like a hare. Gousseau was holding his sides, revelling in the occurrence. He risked nothing by waiting. No power on earth could help the tramp escape, or keep him from the sound thrashing which he had earned, and from being conveyed, under safe escort, to the town jail. The farmer took a gun and went out to his two labourers. "'Anything fresh?' "'No, Farmer Gousseau, not yet.' "'We shan't have long to wait, unless old Nick carries him over the walls.' From time to time they heard the four brothers hailing one another in the distance. The old bird was evidently making a fight for it was more active than they would have thought. Still, with sturdy fellows like the Gousseau brothers. However, one of them returned, looking rather crestfallen, and made no secret of his opinion. It's no use keeping on at it for the present. It's pitch dark. The old chap must have crept into some hole. We'll hunt him out tomorrow. Tomorrow? Why, lad, you're off your chump, protested the farmer. The eldest son now appeared, quite out of breath, and was of the same opinion as his brother. Why not wait till next day, seeing that the ruffian was as safe within the demesne as between the walls of a prison? "'Well, I'll go myself,' cried old Gousseau. "'Light me a lantern, somebody.' But at that moment three gendarmes arrived, and a number of village lads also came up to hear the latest. The sergeant of gendarmes was a man of method. He first insisted on hearing the whole story in full detail. Then he stopped to think. Then he questioned the four brothers, separately, and took his time for reflection after each deposition. When he had learnt from them that the tramp had fled toward the back of the estate, that he had been lost sight of repeatedly, and that he had finally disappeared near a place known as the Crow's Knoll, he meditated once more and announced his conclusion. Better wait. Old Trenard might slip through our hands amidst all the confusion of a pursuit in the dark, 
and then good night, everybody. The farmer shrugged his shoulders and, cursing under his breath, yielded to the sergeant's arguments. That worthy organized a strict watch, distributed the brothers Gousseau and the lads from the village under his men's eyes, made sure that the ladders were locked away, and established his headquarters in the dining-room, where he and Farmer Gousseau sat and nodded over a decanter of old brandy. The night passed quietly. Every two hours the sergeant went his rounds and inspected the posts. There were no alarms. Old Trenard did not budge from his hole. The battle began at break of day. It lasted four hours. In those four hours the thirteen acres of land within the walls were searched, explored, gone over in every direction by a score of men who beat the bushes with sticks, trampled over the tall grass, rummaged in the hollows of the trees, and scattered the heaps of dry leaves. And old Trenard remained invisible. "'Well, this is a bit thick,' growled Gousseau. "'Beats me altogether,' retorted the sergeant. And indeed there was no explaining the phenomenon. For after all, apart from a few old clumps of laurels and spindle-trees, which were thoroughly beaten, all the trees were bare. There was no hiding, there was no building, no shed, no stack, nothing, in short, that could serve as a hiding-place. As for the wall, a careful inspection convinced even the sergeant that it was physically impossible to scale it. In the afternoon the investigations were begun all over again in the presence of the examining magistrate and the public prosecutor's deputy. The results were no more successful. Nay, worse, the officials looked upon the matter as so suspicious that they could not restrain their ill-humour and asked, "'Are you quite sure, Farmer Gousseau, that you and your sons haven't been seeing double?' "'And what about my wife?' retorted the farmer, red with anger. "'Did she see double when the scamp had her by the throat? Go and look at the marks, if you doubt me.' "'Very well. But then where is the scamp? Here, between those four walls.' "'Very well. Then ferret him out. We give it up. It's quite clear that if a man were hidden within the precincts of this farm, we should have found him by now.' "'I swear I'll lay hands on him, true as I stand here,' shouted Farmer Gousseau. "'It shall not be said that I have been robbed of six thousand francs. Yes, six thousand. There were three cows I sold, and then the wheat crop, and then the apples. Six thousand franc notes, which I was just going to take to the bank. Well, I swear to heaven that the money's as good as in my pocket.' "'That's all right, and I wish you luck,' said the examining magistrate, as he went away, followed by the deputy and the gendarme. The neighbours also walked off in a more or less facetious mood, and by the end of the afternoon none remained but the Gousseaus and the two farm labourers. Old Gousseau at once explained his plan. By day they were to search, at night they were to keep an incessant watch. It would last as long as it had to. Hang it, old Trenat was a man like other men, and men have to eat and drink.' Old Trenard must needs, therefore, come out of his earth to eat and drink. At most, said Gousseau, he can have a few crusts of bread in his pocket, or even pull up a root or two at night. But as far as drink's concerned, no go. There's only the spring, and you'll be a clever dog if he gets near that. He himself that evening took up his stand near the spring. Three hours later his eldest son relieved him. The other brothers and the farmhand slept in the house, each taking his turn of the watch, and keeping all the lamps and candles lit, so that there might be no surprise. So it went on for fourteen consecutive nights, and for fourteen days, while two of the men and Mother Gousseau remained on guard, the five others explored the Héberville ground. At the end of that fortnight, not a sign. The farmer never ceased storming. He sent out for a retired detective inspector who lived in the neighboring town. The inspector stayed with him for a whole week, he found neither old Trenard nor the least clue that could give them any hope of finding old Trenard. "'It's a bit thick,' repeated Farmer Gousseau. "'For he's there, the rascal. As far as being anywhere goes, he's there. So—' Planting himself on the threshold, he railed at the enemy at the top of his voice. "'You blithering idiot! Would you rather croak in your hole than fork out the money? Then croak, you pig!' And Mother Gousseau, in her turn, yelped in her shrill voice. "'Is it prison you're afraid of? Hand over the notes and you can hook it.' But old Trenard did not breathe a word, and the husband and wife tired their lungs in vain. Shocking days passed. Farmer Gousseau could no longer sleep, lay shivering with fever. The sons became morose and quarrelsome, and never let their guns out of their hands, having no other idea but to shoot the tramp. It was the one topic of conversation in the village, 
and the Gousseau story, from being local at first, soon went the round of the press. Newspaper reporters came from the Assize town, from Paris itself, and were rudely shown the door by Farmer Gousseau. "'Each man his own house,' he said. "'You mind your business. I mind mine. It's nothing to do with any one. Still, Farmer Gousseau, go to blazes!' And he slammed the door in their face. Old Trenard had now been hidden within the walls of Héberville for something like four weeks. The Gousseaus continued their search as doggedly and confidently as ever, but with daily decreasing hope, as though they were confronted with one of those mysterious obstacles which discourage human effort, and the idea that they would never see their money again began to take root in them. One fine morning at about ten o'clock, a motor-car, crossing the village square at full speed, broke down and came to a dead stop. The driver, after a careful inspection, declared that the repairs would take some little time, whereupon the owner of the car resolved to wait at the inn and lunch. He was a gentleman on the right side of forty, with close-cropped side-whiskers and a pleasant expression of face, and he soon made himself at home with the people at the inn. Of course they told him the story of the Gousseaus. He had not heard it before, as he had been abroad, but it seemed to interest him greatly. He made them give him all the details, raised objections, discussed various theories with a number of people who were eating at the same table, and ended by exclaiming, "'Nonsense! It can't be so intricate as all that. I've had some experience of this sort of thing, and if I were on the premises—' "'That's easily arranged,' said the innkeeper. "'I know Farmer Gousseau. He won't object.' The request was soon made and granted. Old Gousseau was in one of those frames of mind when we are less disposed to protest against outside interference. His wife, at any rate, was very firm. "'Let the gentleman come if he wants to.' The gentleman paid his bill and instructed his driver to try the car on the high road as soon as the repairs were finished. "'I shall want an hour,' he said. "'No more. Be ready in an hour's time.' Then he went to Farmer Gousseau's. He did not say much at the farm. Old Gousseau, hoping against hope, was lavish with information, took his visitor along the walls down to the little door opening on the fields, produced the key and gave minute details of all the searches that had been made so far. Oddly enough, the stranger, who hardly spoke, seemed not to listen either. He merely looked, with a rather vacant gaze. When they had been round the estate, old Gousseau asked anxiously, "'Well?' "'Well what?' "'Do you think you know?' The visitor stood for a moment without answering, then he said, "'No, nothing.' "'Why, of course not,' cried the farmer, throwing up his arms. "'How should you know? It's all hanky-panky. Shall I tell you what I think?' Well, that old Trenard has been so jolly clever that he's lying dead in his hole, and the banknotes are rotting with him. Do you hear? You can take my word for it. The gentleman said very calmly, There's only one thing that interests me. The tramp, all said and done, was free at night and able to feed on what he could pick up. But how about drinking? Out of the question, shouted the farmer, quite out of the question. There's no water except this, and we have kept watch beside it every night. It's a spring. Where does it rise? Here, where we stand. Is there enough pressure to bring it into the pool of itself? Yes. And where does the water go when it runs out of the pool? Into this pipe here, which goes underground, and carries it to the house for use in the kitchen. So there's no way of drinking, seeing that we were there, and that the spring is twenty yards from the house. Hasn't it rained during the last four weeks? Not once. I've told you that already. The stranger went to the spring and examined it. The trough was formed of a few boards of wood joined together just above the ground, and the water ran through it, slow and clear. "'The water's not more than a foot deep, is it?' he asked. In order to measure it, he picked up from the grass a straw which he dipped into the pool. But as he was stooping, he suddenly broke off and looked around him. <laughs> oh, how funny!' he said, bursting into a peal of laughter. "'Why, what's the matter?' spluttered old Gousseau, rushing toward the pool, as though a man could have lain hidden between those narrow boards. And Mother Gousseau clasped her hands. "'What is it? Have you seen him? Where is he?' <laughs> "'Neither in it nor under it,' replied the stranger, who was still laughing. He made for the house, eagerly followed by the farmer, the old woman, and the four sons. The innkeeper was there also, as were the people from the inn who had been watching the stranger's movements and there was a dead silence while they waited for the extraordinary disclosure. "'It's as I thought,' he said, with an amused expression. "'The old chap had to quench his thirst somewhere, and as there was only the spring—' 
oh, but look here growled farmer goussot we should have seen him it was at night we should have heard him and seen him too as we were close by so was he and he drank the water from the pool yes how from a little way off with what with this and the stranger showed the straw which he had picked up there here's the straw for the customer's long drink you will see there's more of it than usual in fact it is made of three straws stuck into one another that was the first thing i noticed those three straws fastened together the proof is conclusive but hang it all the proof of what cried farmer goussot irritably the stranger took a shotgun from the rack is it loaded he asked yes said the youngest of the brothers i use it to kill the sparrows with for fun it's small shot capital a peppering where it won't hurt him will do the trick his face suddenly assumed a masterful look he gripped the farmer by the arm and rapped out in an imperious tone listen to me farmer goussot i'm not here to do policeman's work and i won't have the poor beggar locked up at any price four weeks of starvation and fright is good enough for anybody so you've got to swear to me you and your sons that you'll let him off without hurting him you must hand over the money well of course do you swear i swear the gentleman walked back to the door sill at the entrance to the orchard he took a quick aim pointing his gun a little in the air in the direction of the cherry tree which overhung the spring he fired a hoarse cry rang from the tree and the scarecrow which had been straddling the main branch for a month past came tumbling to the ground only to jump up at once and make off as fast as its legs could carry it there was a moment's amazement followed by outcries the sons darted in pursuit and were not long in coming up with the runaway hampered as he was by his rags and weakened by privation but the stranger was already protecting him against their wrath hands off there this man belongs to me i won't have him touched i hope i haven't stung you up too much trenard standing on his straw legs wrapped round with strips of tattered cloth with his arms and his whole body clad in the same materials his head swathed in linen tightly packed like a sausage the old chap still had the stiff appearance of a lay figure and the whole effect was so ludicrous and so unexpected that the onlooker screamed with laughter the stranger unbound his head and they saw a veiled mask of tangled grey beard encroaching on every side upon a skeleton face lit up by two eyes burning with fever the laughter was louder than ever the money the six notes roared the farmer the stranger kept him at a distance one moment we'll give you that back shan't we trenard and taking his knife and cutting away the straw and cloth he jested cheerily you poor old beggar what a guy you look but how on earth did you manage to pull off that trick you must be confoundedly clever or else you had the devil's own luck so on the first night you used the breathing time they left you to rig yourself in these togs not a bad idea who could ever suspect a scarecrow they were so accustomed to seeing it stuck up in its tree but poor old daddy how uncomfortable you must have felt lying flat up there on your stomach with your arms and legs dangling down all day long like that the juice of an attitude and how you must have been put to it when you ventured to move a limb eh and how you must have funked going to sleep and then you had to eat and drink and you heard the sentry and felt the barrel of his gun within a yard of your nose <laughs> but the trickiest of all you know was your bit of straw upon my word when i think that without a sound without a movement so to speak you had to fish out lengths of straw from your toggery fix them end to end let your apparatus down to the water and suck up the heavenly moisture drop by drop upon my word one could scream with admiration well done trenard and he added between his teeth oh, you're in a very unappetizing state my man haven't you washed yourself all this month you old pig after all you had as much water as you wanted here you people i hand him over to you i'm going to wash my hands that's what i'm going to do farmer goussot and his four sons grabbed at the prey which he was abandoning to them now then come along fork out the money dazed as he was the tramp still managed to simulate astonishment don't put on that idiotic look growled the farmer come on out with the six notes what what do you want of me stammered old trenard the money on the nail what money the bank notes the bank notes oh i'm getting sick of you 
here lads they laid the old fellow flat tore off the rags that composed his clothes felt and searched him all over there was nothing on him you thief and you robber yelled old goussot what have you done with it the old beggar seemed more dazed than ever too cunning to confess he kept on whining what do you want of me money i haven't three sous to call my own but his eyes wide with wonder remained fixed upon his clothes and he himself seemed not to understand the goussot's rage could no longer be restrained they rained blows upon him which did not improve matters but the farmer was convinced that Trenard had hidden the money before turning himself into the scarecrow. "'Where have you put it, you scum? Out with it! In what part of the orchard have you hidden it?' "'The money?' repeated the tramp with a stupid look. "'Yes, the money, the money which you buried somewhere. Oh, if we don't find it, your goose is cooked. We have witnesses, haven't we? All of you friends, eh? And then the gentleman.' He turned, with the intention of addressing the stranger, in the direction of a spring, which was thirty or forty steps to the left, and he was quite surprised not to see him washing his hands there. "'Has he gone?' he asked. Someone answered, "'No, he lit a cigarette and went for a stroll in the orchard.' "'Oh, that's all right,' said the farmer. "'He's the sort to find the notes for us, just as he's found the man.' "'Unless,' said a voice. "'Unless what?' echoed the farmer. "'What do you mean?' "'Have you something in your head? Out with it, then. What is it?' But he interrupted himself suddenly, seized with a doubt, and there was a moment's silence. The same idea dawned on all the country folk. The stranger's arrival at Héberville, the breakdown of his motor, his manner of questioning the people at the inn and of gaining admission to the farm, were not all these part and parcel of a put-up job, the trick of a cracksman who had learned the story from the papers, and who had come to try his luck on the spot. "'Jolly smart of him,' said the innkeeper. "'He must have taken the money from old Trenard's pocket before our eyes, while he was searching him.' "'Impossible!' spluttered Farmer Goussot. "'He would have been seen going out that way, by the house, whereas he's strolling in the orchard.' Mother Goussot, all of a heap, suggested, "'The little door at the end, down there.' "'The key never leaves me.' "'But you showed it to him.' "'Yes, and I took it back again. Look, here it is.' He clapped his hand to his pocket and uttered a cry. "'Oh, dash it all! It's gone! He sneaked it!' He at once rushed away, followed and escorted by his sons and a number of the villagers. When they were halfway down the orchard, they heard the throb of a motor-car, obviously the one belonging to the stranger, who had given orders to his chauffeur to wait for him at that lower entrance. When the Goussots reached the door, they saw scrawled with a brick, on the worm-eaten panel, the two words, Arsène Lupin. Stick to it as the angry Goussots might, they found it impossible to prove that old Trenard had stolen any money. Twenty persons had to bear witness that, when all was said, nothing was discovered on his person. He escaped with a few months' imprisonment for the assault. He did not regret them. As soon as he was released, he was secretly informed that every quarter, on a given date, at a given hour, under a given milestone, on a given road, he would find three gold louis. To a man like old Trenard, that means wealth. End of chapter 9